Good evening. Welcome to the journey home. I want to extend my welcome to you who are watching us by television or by tape, but especially those who are listening to us by radio around the world. Sometimes I wonder if we take you for granted when we're so focused here on the television. My prayer is that our discussion together tonight is an encouragement in your faith, drawing you closer to Christ and his church. My guest for tonight's program is Mark Bromley. He's going to talk to us about his journey to the Catholic faith and the theme which we'll focus on, but also was the thread throughout his journey, was the, seek, the, the search for the true church. Is there a true church? Can the true church be found? Is it right to think that of all the churches, there is one that is true? Those are the topics we'll look at tonight. And remember, you're an important part of this program. So put your questions down on paper and then give us a call. 1-800-221-9460. If you'd like to send us your question by email, it's journeyhome at EWTN.com. Mark, welcome to the program. Well, it's great to be here. Now, you're uh, no stranger to EWTN, is that right? I've been on a couple times on Mother's show and uh, John at Beckovich's show, and I've been around a little bit. Often as an apologist? Yeah, more or less as an apologist, yeah. Because that's kind of your avocation. A little bit, sense. yeah. I used to work with Catholic Answers and things of that sort. And now? Now I'm working at Ignatius Press and managing editor for Catholic Dossier and the Catholic Faith Magazine. Give a chance to hold these there up so the audience can see the, the magazines that you're actually the editor of. I'm right? managing editor. Work with uh, Ralph McInerney on Dossier and Father John Harden on the Catholic Faith. So. All right. And of course, if the audience is interested in finding out information about either of these later in the program, they'll see the address. Great. But let's jump right into it. Uh, the normal question that I ask the guest as we begin the program is to fill in the background the early part of your journey before the Catholic Church really was an issue in your life. Well, I started out as a nothing, which doesn't mean I was... <laughs> well, some, we people say, out well. some people say you haven't gone very far, but um, you know, I started out as a South St. Louis non-affiliated theist, which means I believed in God. My parents raised, we, they were theists. They weren't churchgoers, although remotely, in, in the remote past, uh, they had you know, Catholic ancestry, but uh, good moral people, but never went to church. And that's how I grew up as sort of the, one of the unchurched, the unchurched, part of the unchurched mass out there. I hate there. to jump into this, but the idea of people having a belief in a God, right. but no need to commit themselves to a church. Yeah. You think that's common today? Oh, yes. Widespread. 93% okay. uh, of Americans say they believe in God, and yet a large percentage, probably half of them, don't go to church on a regular basis. If they identify with a church, it's kind of vague and loose, okay. loose identification. So that's where I was at. Then in high school, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. <laughs> And I became a Christian, uh, reading Hal Lindsey's late, great Planet Earth. Oh, interesting. This is back in the 70s. And I like to describe myself as someone who came into Christianity on the tail end of the Jesus movement. <laughs> Being a Midwesterner, I think the Jesus movement had reached St. Louis a little late. <laughs> uh, but uh, I became a Christian. And I really, um, the God whom I had always believed in and said my prayers to, uh, he took on a concrete form in the person of Jesus Christ. And... And I gave my life to Christ and became a somewhat militantly anti-Catholic fundamentalist. I joined a fundamentalist church and was a member there for a number of years, but was very, very anti-Catholic. You know, you've probably heard this story before. The Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon and a part of the apostate coming one world religion. And I really believed I would be sitting around waiting for the rapture. Jesus would come and take me and uh, all the other true Christians and that the Catholics would be left behind. That anti-Catholic idea behind mm -hmm. your faith? Was it a regular part of what you were taught and a part of the preaching and teaching? It was part of what uh, was taught at the church that I attended, the storefront church I attended, um, but it was more things I imbibed from a lot of the um, kind of what I consider fringe fundamentalist literature. Mm -hmm. most, you know, most fundamentalists don't spend all their time talking about the Catholic Church. Right. They talk about Jesus and they believe the Catholic Church is wrong on some important points and so it does come up. But I kind of fell into that anti-Catholic fringe where this became a, hmm. a, a passion with me. Hmm. Uh, and fortunately, um, I wasn't stuck in that fundamentalism for long. I, I began to read things by C.S. Lewis and other people. And my vision of Christianity expand. And I, I moved from a, kind of a very narrow fundamentalism to a more mainstream evangelicalism. 
looked around at different churches. Again, this is in the late 70s, when, you know, 1976, the year of the evangelical, the born-again Christian. Uh, that was really where I was at at the time. So. At that time, um, how would you have viewed our topic tonight? Would you have thought of the churches you were in as the true churches? Or would you have considered that there was a true church? Well, I be definitely believed that there was a true church, but I thought it was invisible, that it was the uh, sum total of all of the individual believers, the real believers, not the people that went to apostate religion, which was the Roman Catholic Church and mainline Protestant denominations, um, and that the real church was out there but hidden. It was among the professed and believing Christians, and that that the real church would be raptured, taken out of the world so when that, the end came. And that sounds like the fundamentalist perspective, right. but you then advanced even when you got into more evangelicalism. Right. Did your view of the true church change? It did. Um, I came to see that the, the church had to have some concrete historical embodiment, that it wasn't this invisible, nebulous thing out there. And really, I have to uh, credit C.S. Lewis uh, for helping me to see that. It's ironic that this Anglican, who never became a Catholic, has been so influential in bringing so many people to the, to the Catholic Church. Right. Um, I didn't immediately glom onto the idea that the Catholic Church was the church, but I began to look into the history of the church, going back to the Reformation, even before the Reformation, looking into the church fathers. And um, I began to be open to certain doctrines that were taught by the Catholic Church, but I was open to them in spite of the fact that they were taught by the Catholic Church, not because of them, but because of it being taught by the Church. It's really amazing to think that in this century particularly, the idea that, that there is no true church body, that it's mm -hmm. more this invisible idea, has become so pervasive, right. given the fact that how for most of the history of the Church, there was the idea that Christ had established a church and he guided the church of the spirit and that that church could be found and been a, been a part of. What is it in your own journey then that, uh, that got your attention, that opened your heart to the Catholic church? Well, it was really studying scripture and church history and, and asking myself, where, should, where do I belong? Hmm. Um, Jesus is the reason why I'm a Catholic. I mean, people ask, why did you become a Catholic? Was it this, was it that? Ultimately, it was Jesus, fidelity to Jesus, wanting to do his will. What is, your, what is your will, Jesus? Where is your truth? Where is your church? Trying to answer those questions and really studying scripture and finding that in, on the pages of the New Testament, we see a church which is united in its faith. It's a concrete, visible institution. It's not some invisible, nebulous reality out there, but a concrete, visible institution. You could, if the, if the church in Corinth had had an address, you could write it down and send them a letter. It was that concrete, one in faith, one in a common liturgical life, although I wouldn't have used the word liturgical, but we see baptism, we see confirmation, we see the Holy Eucharist. These were all shared. You know, Paul could go to Corinth and they had the Eucharist, or Paul could go to Galatia and they had the Eucharist. It was the same church. It wasn't like, well, in, some, in our church we only have two sacraments, and then down there in Philippi it, it's three sacraments, and then you go back to Jerusalem and it's back to two. No, they had a common sacramental structure, and they had a common authority structure. The apostles were a universal authority in the church, recognized everywhere. Paul, as you read the pastoral epistles of Paul, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, what does he do? He establishes pastors, invests them with a share of his own authority, and I came to the conclusion that this is what the church in the, of the New Testament looks like. And that left me with some options. The option was either that church no longer exists, once existed at the time of the New Testament, but has disappeared. And if that's true, then Jesus was a liar. Because Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. So I couldn't believe that. Or that New Testament church existed throughout history and existed today. And I, when I looked at evangelicalism and the various denominations, and I, you know, these are good uh, men and women of God trying to follow Christ in the Scripture, what we see is conflict, disagreement. Even when people get along, they still disagree on some very important issues. How many sacraments are there? What is a sacrament? Did, did Christ establish sacraments or ordinances? Uh, how are we saved? Are you saved by faith alone? And what's the nature of the salvation that you receive? Uh, all sorts of questions about church government. Is it congregationalism, a Presbyterian structure, an Episcopal structure? I found good Christian men and women who were all committed to the Scripture. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a matter of, well, some follow the Bible, some didn't. They all 
tried to follow the Bible, they studied the Scripture, and yet they came to conflicting conclusions on these very, very important issues. Mm -hmm. So I had to conclude not that there was something wrong with the Bible, but that these very good uh, men and women were trying to use the Bible in a way God never intended. And so I was forced to conclude that this principle within Protestantism in general that looked to the Scripture but without any kind of authority that could say, this is the authentic message, that this was not compatible fundamentally with what we see on the pages of the New Testament. And that really left me with two options. It was either the Roman Catholic Church or it was Eastern Orthodoxy. And partly for cultural reasons, because Orthodoxy was an alien thing to me, but also because it seemed to me that Eastern Orthodoxy, although there's much to respect there, and we Catholics recognize the validity of the Orthodox sacraments uh, and the great common heritage we have with the Eastern Church, it nevertheless was fundamentally what I called uh, congregationalism with cope and mitre. There was no principle of unity as we have in the Catholic Church that could unite the various patriarchs. There was no Peter. There was no Petrine ministry. And once I accepted that, um, it was pretty much a done deal that uh, the Catholic Church was Christ's church. So I, I sort of backed my way into the church. One verse that came to mind a little earlier was that verse from Ephesians 4 that talks about all the unity. Yes. You know, and I was, well, maybe read that one and have you comment on this. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. What did we do with that verse back right. then? Well, what I understood that to mean is that there's sort of an invisible universal unity to the church. And, of course, we believe that there is an invisible yeah. unity to the church. As Catholics, we believe that. But the New Testament church was a lot more than that. That invisible unity was concretely expressed in the apostolic ministry in a very visible form. If you were out of communion with the apostles, you were out of communion with the church. That's why Jesus said, he who hears you hears me. Okay, so there's a concrete, visible, institutional dimension. It's not all the church is. It's not merely an institution, but it has a concrete, institutional dimension to it. The other thing I'd say is that I found it very hard to believe that while there was this invisible spiritual unity, that no one could speak for the church. It was incredible. The idea that there was no one who could speak in the name of the church, as we see in the early church uh, in the apostles. Not that the bishops today are apostles in the sense of the early apostles receiving re new revelation. We don't believe that as Catholics. But if the church is going to be fundamentally the same church as it was in Jesus' time, there needs to be someone who can speak in the name of the church and for the church. And there isn't that within evangelicalism and Protestantism. Boy, you reminded me of another text that is so important here. And that's that text from Romans 10 yes. that says, you know, how are they going to... Um, to know unless someone preaches. Exactly. Okay, and it goes on and makes all these things. How are they going to, <clears throat> how are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without a preacher? And how can men preach unless they are sent? That's exactly right. Talk about the, the importance of the issue of being sent. Well, right. And where do we get our authority? I mean, do, is, does it come from us? Does it come from some subjective sense of, oh, I've been called, so I'm going to do my, you know, give you my interpretation of the Scripture, and I'm going to go put out my placard for my church, and we're going to start our own church? No, there needs to be a sense of continuity and of having been sent. And that was something that the Catholic Church has. Mm -hmm. The continuity from the present day all the way back through the medieval church to the early church, the fathers of the church, when you look and see what those men taught, they taught the faith of the, of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. There's a continuity from the New Testament all the way up to Pope John Paul II. And that's, that's a very important point, and it was for mm -hmm. me. Now, I want to be clear in saying this. I'm not trying to um, attack Protestantism because... Certainly, the teaching of the church is, as recently articulated by our Holy Father in his encyclical on Christian unity, is that there are many gifts that Christ has given to the church that exist outside her visible structure. And that the, our brothers and sisters really know Jesus. Yeah. They have the scripture. They have the Holy Spirit. And all of those things are authentic shares in the gifts that Christ has bequeathed to the church. Nevertheless, he wills this, these gifts to be exercised in the full unity of the church that he established. 
And that's something we have to keep in mind. Let's address a couple of specific questions about this theme then. You've already addressed them a little bit. Let's make sure we get them concrete all to right. understand. First of all, what does the Catholic Church mean when it teaches that it's a true church? And maybe the other flip side is, does it still, does it actually teach that still? Yeah, well, I can answer the second question easier. <laughs> yes, it does teach that. Uh, the church teaches that, that the Catholic Church was established by Christ. So that this is, it's not like... Uh, Christ established the church, a church, and then over time it gradually evolved into the Catholic Church. No, there is a concrete historical continuity between the apostles that Jesus established and the men that those apostles appointed as bishops and their successors on down through today. It's a, cont a continuity of authority. It's a continuity of faith. We teach, they teach the same faith. The faith of the apostles is the faith of the church today, has been throughout history. It's a continuity in ritual. The seven sacraments of the church are on the pages of the New Testament throughout the history of the church uh, down to the present day. The authority of the Bishop of Rome is the successor of St. Peter, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, where Jesus gives Peter the authority to be the foundation of the church, gives him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, makes him, in effect, his uh, apostolic prime minister for the kingdom of heaven. All of that is on the pages of the New Testament. So we see that that is the church, the true church. Now, we want to be clear, and this is a point that the Second Vatican Council really wanted to stress, that when we think of the Catholic Church as the church Christ founded, that doesn't mean that non-Catholic Christians aren't Christian, that they don't have any kind of fellowship with Jesus, or that they don't have any of the gifts that Christ bequeathed this church. What it does mean is that in history, if you want to see where the church that Christ founded exists concretely, it exists in the Catholic Church. Other churches, more or less what we call churches, or as the Second Vatican Council says, ecclesial communities, will have this element or that element of what Christ gave to his church. But only in the Catholic Church do we find the fullness of Christianity, the fullness of what Christ bequeathed to his church. So yes, the Catholic Church is the true church in that sense, without meaning to uh, demean or take anything away from those elements of Christianity that exist outside the visible structure of the church. Does true mean perfect? True does not mean perfect. Uh, we should, hey, that's an interesting point. Is the church perfect? Well, from a certain vantage point, it is. You know, in the old days, we used to speak of the church as the perfect society. Mm -hmm. That meant that it had all the equipment necessary to carry out the mission that Jesus gave it. Doesn't mean that we as individual Catholics <laughs> always make use of the gifts that the Lord has given us. I know in my own life that's the case. I was going to say, it's certainly not perfect because you and I are part of it. That's <laughs> right. If you had to be perfect to be, to be a Catholic, we wouldn't be allowed in. Well, one of the reasons I also brought that up is that when I have heard a lot of anti-Catholic literature or, or haranguing against the church, often the majority of it is just pointing at the flaws. Right. Well, that was the, one of the main, major reasons why I had a problem with the Catholic Church. You know, I came to a certain certitude about its teaching and a doctrine. It looked fine. It looked wonderful. I was convinced it was true. It was just those Catholics yeah. that just didn't live up to what their church taught. Yeah. And it was only after I read Galatians and 1 Corinthians again and prayed over it and I you know, went down these dirty laundry lists of sin that we see in those churches that Paul talks about, that I said, there are the Catholics. They're right there in the New Testament. And it became clear to me that, that the church in history is always going to be a mixed bag. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be proud of that fact. We shouldn't uh, sort of tolerate a lack of faith or a lack of love or a lack of zeal. But we oughtn't be surprised about it. In this ecumenical age, it seems like something, though, that is less talked about in the church, is less promoted, and, and maybe even among certain circles seems like an uncharitable thing for us to talk about. Is it an important thing for us to hold on to? Well, the idea that the, the, church, the Catholic Church is the church founded by Christ. Yes. Yeah, well, of course, because it's true. Anytime it's, something is true, it's important to hold on to it. I think what Vatican II has tried to do, and I think it's been misunderstood, Vatican II tried to find a way to talk about the church as being the true church or the church of Christ in a way that did not uh, slight the real uh, share that non-Catholics have uh, in the life of Christ. There's an, you know, Vatican II says that non-Catholic Christians 
have a real but imperfect communion with the Church of Christ. Not that they're full members or they're fully united or in full communion with the church, but they have to be united to a certain extent because they have the same Jesus and they have the same Holy Spirit. So what the Vatican Council tried to do was talk about the church as the true church in a way that didn't give the wrong impression, namely that non-Catholic Christians didn't have anything to do with Christ. But that's been misunderstood. And a lot of people have taken that to mean, well, therefore, we shouldn't ever talk about the Catholic Church as the Church of Christ, or we should never talk about it in such a way as to maybe try and encourage Protestants to consider the Church. And that's very wrong. If you go back and you look at the decree on ecumenism, uh, it talks about the fact that Christian unity uh, is aimed at having a full visible unity, and that it understands that unity to be a unity in the Catholic faith. So uh, while we, you know, we respect differences with our Protestant brothers and sisters, that doesn't mean we compromise on the truth. We need to engage them in a charitable dialogue, uh, but we need to dialogue with them. I asked really about true and perfect. And the reason I asked this other question was that um, it seems today that maybe one of the, quote, heresies that's kind of flowing around is this idea that kind of a misinterpretation of what charity means. Yeah. And it, 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 the idea of being charitable, pretty soon we start watering down everything else that divides us. As if charity means um, getting rid of all the barriers that will stand in the way of us. And, 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 and the end result, truth is set aside. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly not what the martyrs thought. No, oh, I don't know. I mean, they're willing to die for this church and its beliefs. When we think of church, true church, there are a lot of, of, uh, of aspects of that. I mean, there's the institutional angle on the church, all right? Then there's its teachings, uh, and there's its people, all right? And, of course, there's its structures, right. the church. And, but there's also the true church being the spiritual side of the church. Talk a little bit about the spirituality of the true church. Well, uh, it's there in the New Testament. When we see the New Testament, the church is the church founded by Jesus. It's the church that Jesus gives his spirit to. It's the church that is called to holiness. Uh, interesting, we have this paradox in the New Testament. On the one hand, the church is holy. Uh, the very notion of the church, the ecclesia, the people that are called out. Called out from what? Called out to sin. Washed, purified, as Ephesians 5 talks about, the church is being washed in the water of the word, and it's cleansed, a spotless bride and all of that. That's an inherent dimension of the, of the church. We talk about the four marks of the church, one of which is holiness. Yeah. And yet, the same New Testament talks about the need for us to strive, yeah. as it says in Hebrews, you know, Hebrews chapter 12, to strive for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. There's this paradox. We're holy, and yet we need to attain a level of holiness, not by our own efforts, but by the grace of God at work in us. And that's true in history when we look at the church as an institution. We see sin, people sinning. We see individuals you know, doing horrible things. The Holy Father has even called the church to look back and, and uh, think about the things that uh, her sons and daughters have done in the past mm -hmm. and repent of those things. So there's a real concrete need to always be reforming and renewing and converting. And yet there's a certain basic holiness that we have because we are united with Jesus in the church, one with him in spirit, and united in the sacraments, the sacramental life of the church, united in listening to the same word. We all hear the same word of God proclaimed by the teaching office of the church, makes us holy. And then we have pastors who guide us in the way of holiness. So this is all the spiritual dimension uh, we keep in mind that the church is a human and divine mystery. There's a divine side of it, the activity of the Spirit, and there's a human side which at times uh, falls very short of what Jesus is calling us to. True church. Let's talk a bit about true membership. Ah. And because I work with converts all the time, we've got to make sure that we don't think that, oh, whew, I got my name on the line now, right. as if that's what it means. Uh, and maybe as a verse to jump off that with this is that verse from 1 John that says, the reason he's telling them all this stuff is so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Membership has something to do with fellowship. Yes, it does. Is fellowship coffee and donuts and going bowling? <laughs> Not that, or it's more than that. 
uh, Vatican II uh, took as one of the fundamental ways it thinks of the church, conceives of the church, is as communion or a union with. Sometimes the word communion is translated as fellowship. Uh, there is a basic unity that we have. It's a twofold unity. It's a unity in Christ, that is to say we're united with one another, but it's a, a unity in Christ because it's a unity first and foremost with Christ. We, by being united with Jesus, are united with one another. That's why we call the church the body of Christ. You know, he is the source of our unity. When Paul talks about the body of Christ in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's because we're united with Jesus that we're united with one another. So that's an important point. Uh, it's a real pastoral problem in the church today. We have a lot of people who are nominal Catholics. Uh, it always yeah. troubles me when people say, that they were raised Catholic, but then they found Jesus and became a Christian, as if those were two separate realities, when in fact being a Catholic is the way you are fully Christianized. Uh, you're, f you're fully a follower of Jesus Christ. What that tells us is not that there's something wrong with baptizing babies or anything like that. When you're baptized, you're genuinely baptized and incorporated into Christ. But the Word of God has to be nourished. In, uh, the grace that's implanted in baptism has to be nourished by sound catechesis, by evangelization, uh, and growth in the life of grace. Otherwise, it does us no good. You know, one of the, I, you, you've probably seen this bumper sticker, and I, uh, if you've got it on your car, please don't take offense, but I think it, it, it can be understood in a way that shows the, the real nature of the problem. It's a bumper sticker that says, I love being Catholic, with the little heart shape for love. It reminds me of the bumper stickers that say, I love being Italian, or I love being Polish. Um, what's the problem with that? Well, it's a way of conceiving membership in the church as if it were an ethnic identity, rather than a real dynamic relationship we have with Christ and in Christ. Yeah. And that's, that's an important point. Yeah, if we start seeing and focusing just the church as an institution or the things we do or the rights we do and forget the thread, which is Jesus Christ. Exactly. We forget that, in fact, it's flip-flopped. It's our growing closer to Jesus Christ that produces the church. That's right. Exactly. As we grow closer to Jesus, the church grows in unity. Right. Right. And the church suffers right. because our lack of unity with Christ. Exactly. And, and we are less able. I mean, that's why we're Catholics. We're Catholics because of Jesus Christ. And I came into the church because I believed that the Catholic Church brought me closer to Christ in the Word. In other words, if I don't believe all that Christ taught, and it's interesting, you look at the end of Matthew's Gospel, what does he tell the apostles? To teach all that I've observed. You know, when I was an evangelical, and you probably remember this from your days as an evangelical, sometimes people say, well, let's not bother about these doctrinal differences because if it doesn't affect my salvation, it's not important. Okay? <laughs> and you'd even hear people say, doctrine divides, love unites. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but that's not what Jesus said. He told the apostles to teach all that he commanded, not just the basics or the fundamentals or what we agree on, but all. And so I want to know everything that Jesus revealed, because if he took the time to reveal it, it must have been important. Now, I find that only in the Catholic Church do I get all that Jesus revealed. So that d desire, that drive to know all and believe all that Jesus says is naturally going to impel me, I should say supernaturally, going to impel me to embrace the Catholic faith. Likewise, if Jesus gave us baptism and confirmation in himself in the Holy Eucharist and the other sacraments, then I'm not going to be able to say, well, if I want to grow closer to Jesus, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to leave aside these gifts that he's given me as ways of growing closer to him. No, I'm going to want the whole Jesus, Jesus in the sacraments. And finally, if Jesus has established an authority that speaks in his name, and that's what he claimed to do when he said, he who hears you hears me, that's what he claimed to do when he commissioned the apostles, that's what he claimed to do when he made Peter the rock and gave him the keys, then I'm going to want to be in communion with that authority. It's not going to be enough for me to say, well, I got Jesus in the Bible, or I got Jesus when I pray. I want the whole Jesus, the Jesus who teaches through the apostles, the Jesus who governs his church through the successors to the apostles. So all these things are linked together. Very good. Excellent. Let's take a break. Please stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment with some of your questions and emails for our guest about this important issue of seeking the true church.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our topic tonight has been the issue of the true church and my guest, Mark Brumley, who's been just giving us a wonderful perspective on that, both from your own journey and from the teaching of the church. And it's brought up an email, which I knew would be a question on many people's mind. I know from the letters that I get from time to time that this question is brought up. So why don't we jump right into this email? Uh, this is from Eugene. It says, I'm confused. Your guest is saying that those outside the true Church of Christ, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, still have a communion, a fellowship with the Catholic Church. Does your guest believe that those outside the one true Church can be saved? What about the dogma? The dogma that outside the Catholic Church there is no salvation. Does he believe in this dogma? Please explain. Well, yeah, I do believe in that dogma. Uh, it's not only it's been taught throughout the ages in the history of the Church, but it's also taught in the most recent uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church under uh, Article 846. In fact, it uses the words, outside the Church there is no salvation. But when we ask the question, and we can, I'll read a passage from this in a moment, when we ask the question, can someone be saved outside the Roman Catholic Church, we have to be more specific about what we're asking. Does that mean, can someone be saved without being a member of the visible institution of the Church? And the, the Catholic Church teaches and has always taught that, yes, it's possible if someone, through no fault of their own, is outside that hmm. visible membership or visible communion with the Church, that that person can be saved through an invisible communion in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. But we have to be careful here. We can't presume that just because someone says, oh, well, I'm sincere and I believe in Jesus, uh, therefore I'm going to be saved, that that person necessarily is in the status of the kind of person that the church talks about when it talks about the possibility of being saved without necessarily being visibly in communion with the church. But the passage I wanted to read uh, from the Catechism says this. After quoting... Uh, the church's tradition uh, regarding the necessity of the church for salvation from uh, Lumen Gentium, Second Vatican Council's uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, uh, and the necessity of entering. It says, hence they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter or to remain in it. So someone who knows that Christ established the church and either refuses to join or refuses to remain a Catholic cannot be saved. But the Catechism goes on to say, this affirmation is not aimed at those who through no fault of their own do not know Christ and His Church, those who through no fault of their own do not know the Gospel of Christ or His Church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and, moved by grace, try in their actions to do His will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, those too may achieve eternal salvation. Again, that's from uh, Article 8. 47, quoting Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council. There's a lot there that's important to underscore. Yeah. First, that they're moved by grace. We're not saying people on their own can be saved by being sincere. Sincerity doesn't save in and of itself. The grace of Christ can save, and because a person is sincerely seeking the truth, he puts no obstacles to the grace of Christ, even if he's not aware that it's Christ's grace working. Similarly, with respect to non-Catholic Christians, who have a real imperfect communion with the church, that's an invisible communion in Jesus, in the Spirit, but that's provided that they're not putting in an obstacle, that they're not knowingly keeping themselves apart from the visible unity that Christ willed that His church have. Uh, and we can't say, we can't make a blanket statement and say, this or this is not the case with respect to all Protestants or all Eastern Orthodox Christians. So it's not our business to pass that judgment. It is our business, it's our duty and our responsibility and indeed our right to stress that the church is the concrete historical embodiment of what Christ wills all Christians to have and be a part of. It seems like really the big issue here is not whether we can stand in judgment of someone outside the church or not, but that the idea is that if we can say the fear is that if we start saying it doesn't matter for salvation whether you're in the church, that it will all of a sudden say, I don't need to tell anybody else uh -huh. to come home. I don't need to evangelize. I can leave them right where they're at. And the church doesn't teach that. No, no. And in fact, the, the very reason that we, because we can't presume to know the state of another person's soul, that means we have to do everything that Jesus tells us to do to reach that person. And that is we have to proclaim the gospel in its fullness, cool. not just the parts that we agree with 
other Christians on, but the totality. And we're accountable to Jesus for that. You know, when we come before the Lord, we're not going to be able to say, well, I, I didn't say certain things because I wanted to get along. No, we have to proclaim the whole truth. We do it in love. You mentioned charity, and that's got to be our motive. Mm -hmm. You know, Frank Sheed, the great Catholic street teacher and apologist, editor, years ago said that the extent to which we are excited about sharing the whole truth of Jesus, the fullness of the faith, with other Christians, that's a measure of how important it is for us. Mm -hmm. So if we don't find ourselves desiring to share that with others, maybe it's not that important to us. Very good. Let's take our first phone caller for tonight. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Oh, Rita from Pennsylvania. Hello, Rita. What's your question? Okay, uh, my question is along the same lines. Uh, I was just reading C.S. Lewis, yeah. who really had a very spirit-filled life, and his books have touched millions. He really walked with the spirit. Now, if the, the Roman, I do believe the Roman Catholic Church, because of the three treasures, the Eucharist, the Blessed Mother, and the Pope. I mean, these are treasures that any spirit-filled Christian would be yeah. just, you know, in awe to have. Someone like a C.S. Lewis and many, many Protestant brethren who do walk this beautiful walk, yes. why wouldn't the Holy Spirit move them? They're so close to the Spirit. In other words, why, why wouldn't they be drawn to the Church? Um, their, you know, their lives certainly is, is a testament to all of us. And, uh, you know, just reading C.S. Lewis, and, and I'm getting so much from him, and I'm thinking, oh, if only he had the true Eucharist, the Blessed Mother, and the Pope. Very good. All right. The question is, <laughs> we know that our brothers and sisters love Lord Jesus Christ, and we see the evidence of their being filled with the Spirit. Why hasn't the Spirit brought them home? Well, some of them he has brought home. I mean, uh, I think I hope we could count the two of us as someone he's brought home. But I, I can't answer the question in a, on a universal level. I mean, we don't know, and we don't know that in some cases he isn't drawing people. A lot of times, for all we know, many Protestants are brought to Jesus and brought to a fullness of the faith on their deathbed. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, God is allowing it for some purpose, some mysterious purpose. Uh, but we, we can talk about what we do know, and we do know that the fullness of the faith is in the Catholic faith, and we need to teach that and affirm that. Another good uh, part of this is the mystery of conversion anyway. God right. doesn't force anybody to convert. No, he doesn't. There's, there's his, his will in our life, his plan, his grace, but there's also our free will to exactly. respond. They're right. both true. And uh, somebody like C.S. Lewis, I mean, Lewis was a major figure in my conversion to Catholicism because he introduced me to things as, a, as a, you know, him being a Protestant that I would have never accepted from a Catholic. Uh, the notion of tradition, the notion uh, he, you know, he had prayed for the dead and these kind of things. W somebody like a C.S. Lewis, I could accept that and I could... I would at least listen to the rationale for it, whereas I would have never have done that from a Catholic. So there's a valuable yep. uh, lesson there, but why he himself never became a Catholic, it's difficult to say. So we should never quit praying. We should never those, quit praying. Especially in leadership positions. Yeah. Amen. Let's take this next email. When a Protestant minister serves Holy Communion, is it Holy Communion or is it just bread and grape juice? Does Jesus recognize the symbolism of Protestant communion? Thank you for your response. Boy, that's a difficult question from a certain point of view. We know what uh, the Eucharist is at our church. It's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And we know that on the basis of Jesus' promise. Uh, whether or not a Protestant, when they receive the, their Holy Communion, whether or not Jesus is spiritually present there, that's really a subjective matter. I mean, if Jesus wills to make himself present, he can do that. But we have no guarantee. We have no basis for uh, affirming uh, on the basis of some promise that Jesus has made that the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus is there. Where, where do we see the guarantee from a Catholic perspective in our sacraments? Well, we see it in the, in the Scripture. I mean, certainly at the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and wine said, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. So he identified what the Eucharist is, his body and blood, and he also commissioned the apostles to continue this. Mm -hmm. And then when we see that on the pages of the New Testament, Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians, we see the same thing recounted. Paul makes reference to the tradition he has received, mm -hmm. and then he recounts what our Lord did at the Last Supper. So there's continuity there. 
Um, all in the history the, of the apostolic succession. And we, go, we, see in the, and we, see, we see in the early church, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, a uh, friend of John the Apostle, talking about the Eucharist as being the, the very flesh of Jesus that was made incarnate. So it's right there in the early history of the church. Not as spelled out and as articulated as 14, 15, 20 centuries of theology has enabled us to do, but uh, the fundamental truth of the Eucharist is there. It, it's more than just the church saying it so. Yes. Because there's a lot of churches that right. say so. Right. But the foundation behind we believe that this is the body and blood of Christ versus what's over there right. has some real foundation in the Catholic Church that we really make sure that we're, we understand very clearly that gives us what is it that really makes us believe as Catholics that this is the body? Of well, we believe it on the basis of the promise of Jesus. And if Jesus is good, on, good to his word, he's going he's gonna to come through on his promise. And we believe it on the basis of the authority that he's given the church, the apostles and their apostolic successors, the bishops and the priests. We can trace the continuity of the, of the church all the way back to the early apostles. Are there any other denominations that have valid communion? Well, Eastern Orthodox churches, the, they not only believe that their Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, as we do, but their orders are valid. That is to say, their bishops are real bishops, their priests are real priests. And so uh, when they uh, celebrate the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is truly present there. It kind of comes back to the issue we mentioned earlier, the issue of being sent, that yes. a person who is in a position of being a pastor, who then has the authority to preach, teach, and consecrate sacraments. Right. It goes back to who sent him, right. who gave him those orders. Right. And in the Catholic Church, our understanding is that comes from Jesus. It doesn't come from the congregation, although it's nice to have the congregation to be supportive of, of its pastor, but it's not something that the congregation generates. And th this really ties into the notion that we're saved by grace. Yeah. Because this is a grace, that is to say, it's not something we do, it's something that Jesus does for us. And in the sacrament of holy orders, the fact that the, the, the power of the sacrament comes from outside of the congregation, from a bishop ordained by a bishop, ordained by a bishop, mm -hmm. who has the authority from Jesus through the apostles, the special messengers, sent to do this very thing, that's what sets it apart from an idea that the authority comes from the, the, the congregation of the people. Very good. Let's take our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling us from? Good evening, my name is Mary and I'm calling from Maryland. Hello, Mary. Hi, um, I'm wanting some feedback from both of you. I'm just going to throw a couple of ideas out. I'm not as eloquent of a speaker as you two are, but it, you know, the Pope wants us to evangelize and um, I've also heard, you know, uh, pr proclaim the gospel and, if necessary, use words and things like this. And in the past couple of years, I've really come back to my faith. Um, and I have a hard time trying to find a balance with, you know, having a lot of zeal, wanting to speak the truth, and not wanting to uh, turn people away. You know, lately it seems like it comes up in conversation. It's not like I started, but it just it, it comes up in conversation with friends and coworkers. Um, and we get to a point where you know, they want to purgatory or hell or the devil does exist, etc. I don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And I'm not sure how to handle that. And I'm also not sure where's the balance and what would Jesus expect. Very good. The balance of zeal. Oh, and uh, I went to the janitor in one of my churches years ago who was got so excited about evangelism that he said, I'm going to go out there in the street, I'm going to grab somebody. You know, he said, you believe in Jesus, I'm going to beat the cement out of you. you know? I mean, That's <laughs> probably not the way to do it. <laughs> right. The balance of zeal, but also when people are attacking our beliefs, you know, the, the brick walls. Uh, any comments on that? You're an apologist. Well, what's the goal? If the goal is to bring that person into communion with Jesus, then we're going to do the things that will do that, and we're going to avoid the things that won't. And sometimes that means toning down the zeal. If our zeal uh, we find is counterproductive to our goal, then we, we're going to have to find another way of doing it. Um, I don't think there's a, any, uh, you know, evangelization and apologetics is person-specific. You, know, you have to look at the issues that a person is struggling with and try and work with that. You can't say, here's a cookie-cutter way to bring somebody to Christ and the fullness of the Christian faith uh, in the Catholic Church. You have to be discerning. You have to look at your own motive. Is it charity? You know, I engage in apologetics and one of the things that I always 
have to remind myself of, and I try to remind other apologists I work with, is that charity has to be the underlying goal, the love of God and the love of neighbor. That's why we engage in apologetics, not to win arguments or to show people how smart we are, how we made the better choice in becoming Catholic than, than they did. I love that quote in, in Ephesians, is speaking the truth in love. In love. I mean, there's a balance there. Yeah. It's not using truth as a cudgel. All right. But also the love it means telling them the truth. Exactly. They're both important. Let's take, we've got a little time left. Let's take this last email. Here, my wife became a Catholic in 1993, but has always had a problem with confession. She has only gone once in her life, and she feels confident that she can pray directly to God for forgiveness and does not need to go to a priest. I go to confession every two weeks, so we have a real difference of practice, and I have been unsuccessful in getting her to go. She loves everything else with the church, and we go to Mass weekly as a family. Any tips? Love your show. Well, uh, there must be some disconnect here because if someone is a, is a Catholic who really understands what the church teaches, then that person isn't going to say, well, I know the church teaches that the sacrament of reconciliation is important, but I don't really think I need to go. So there's a, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how, what the church is and how it teaches and our obligation to accept the church's teaching that's behind that. But on a more practical level, perhaps, we need to address the question, what did Jesus say and what did Jesus do? Jesus said in John chapter 20, uh, if you forgive the sins of men, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are held bound. And he, he speaking said, to? And he was talking to the apostles mm. and bequeathing to them a share in his ministry of reconciliation, giving them the authority to declare sins forgiven and to bind people if they're unrepentant. Now, Jesus didn't give that authority to them just to be, just for a funny thing to do on, uh, on some resurrection morning. He gave them authority that he intended them to use. And if he intended them to use them, then it, it's sort of an insult to yeah. Jesus to say, yes, Lord, you've given us priests to hear our confession, to forgive our sins in your name, but I'm not going to avail myself of that. Again, it gets at the motive. If our motive is to grow closer to Jesus, and if we are convinced that Jesus has given us the sacrament of reconciliation for us to grow closer to him, then there's no reason why we won't avail ourselves of that sacrament. One or two of those things has to be a, a problem here. Either a person doesn't want to grow closer to Jesus, or if he does, he doesn't really believe that Jesus has given us the sacrament of reconciliation. And so we need to work on one of those two things when we face somebody who says, I'm a Catholic, but I don't believe I should have to go to confession. That was one of those verses that so often we kind of jumped over, I remember, in Protestantism. And I, I think in my background, I remember, I'm just thinking of this verse at the end of John where he says, there are also many other things which Jesus did where every one of them to be written. I suppose the whole world could not yeah. contain the books. So the point is he wrote and contained the things which he thought were essential right. to be remembered. Right. And this was one of the exactly. things. He went to the trouble to do it in the first place and then to tell us he did it. Yeah. So it really isn't up to us to say, yes, Jesus, you did it, but it's not important. Um, one last couple seconds. Coming back to the church, how has it helped you grow closer to Christ? Well, as I say, I came to the church because I thought this is the way I come to Jesus. And it really has helped me. I mean, I, I still have my struggles. I'm sure my wife would, would be uh, <laughs> willing to tell you all about him. But, uh, you know, just having a sense of being in the church that Jesus established, uh, having the fullness of faith, it's really a challenge. I think you know that as well as I do. Uh, we, it's not that we believe less now. We believe so much more, and we have to rely more on God's grace and mercy and living the life of the sacraments and Understanding that, you know, if, if a priest or a bishop or a pastor isn't living a godly life, we can't just chuck all that and go out and start our own thing. It's not our church, it's Jesus's. All of these things present us with challenges, but God's grace is there to help us grow in holiness and become that full person in Jesus that he calls us to be. Mark, thanks a lot for being a part of the program. Well, it's been fun. Really appreciate your, your wisdom and your advice, and also your, your ministry, your postulate of uh, apologetics, defending the Catholic faith. Well, thank you. Good to be here, and you're doing great work. Well, thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments for some final words for the journey home.
to thank you for joining us tonight on this program. <clears throat> Our topic is one that I know from my work helping those come back to the Catholic faith that this is a topic that is right at the core of all the issues that uh, men and women focus on when they consider the Catholic faith. Is there a true church? Is the Catholic the true church? And to answer those questions, I would strongly encourage you to read the Catechism. Many of the questions that were brought up tonight were good questions. And as Mark answered them so well, he was also referring to places in the Catechism where the church has clearly spoken on these issues. So <clears throat> for almost any question you would have about the church, I strongly encourage you to turn to the Catechism. Make it a regular part of your reading. Every day, take a page or two pages to read and then to pray over. Ask the Lord to help you understand what the Catechism teaching, so you would understand the teaching of the church. And I might also encourage you to do that after you've read a couple pages of Scripture. Make it a regular part of your daily devotional. Reading the Word of God and Scripture, and then the sacred tradition of the church. So that, as Mark emphasized, you have the fullness of the teaching of the church. You know, that's what this program is all about. Every week, I pray that our guests are able to share with you not only how the Lord opened their heart to bring them into the Catholic faith, but that they're able to share with you the joy that they've discovered in receiving, experiencing, and learning, and then telling others about the fullness of the Catholic Church. It's not a prideful issue, because in reality, as John the Baptist said, as we go closer to Christ, we want ourselves to diminish. Becoming a true part of the true Church is more and more of growing in union with Christ so that we are less and He is more in our lives. That's what it means to be a Catholic, to love Jesus Christ so much that we give our life totally to Him and to His church. I want to thank you also for the prayers that I know many of you, through your letters, offer to the Lord for this program and for our guests. It's your prayers and your constant commitment to this network that allow this program to continue. So thank you for that. Keep listening. And I look forward to next week when together we'll join on this program, celebrating together our journey home.